Good. Can we turn, please, to Mark chapter 4? Mark chapter 4. And uh, I want to read to you from uh, just the first part of this chapter. So that's Mark's Gospel, chapter 4. If you've not got Bible, uh, you'll find the words will come up. (laughs) Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake, while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching he said, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell among the path, and the birds came and ate it all up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said, Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. And he told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that they might be ever seeing, but never perceiving, and ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then would you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble, persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. That whole uh, section starts off by saying, uh, again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. And we've got to understand something ever so important about Jesus, that he taught It's a big part of what he did. And as we've been reading through Mark's Gospel, we've been reading amazing stories of him healing the sick and having authority over evil spirits. And now we find him teaching as well. And both are equally important. That's the Jesus we can know. That he has, there's power and authority in what he does And there's power and authority in what he says. And we need both. It's not one or the other, it's both and. What a a thrilling testimony to hear of Joe just sharing about a knee. It kind of got better and better the more you heard about it. And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. God is doing things by the power of his spirit. He changes lives by his touch. We heard about that last week. But he also changes lives by his truth. Both are critical. And here we find Jesus teaching, which is interesting in Mark's golf school because he's so full of action, and yet suddenly we kind of hit this zone of teaching. And he teaches by parables, which is quite a fascinating thing because actually parables were kind of, if you've been a Christian and know your Bible a bit, you kind of get used to them. You kind of think, oh, Jesus taught by parables. And we kind of miss the impact of them. And just a couple of things to say about them. One is this, that often 
they're just kind of, they're, they're using everyday life. So this is a very much an everyday life situation. A farmer, seed, sowing, soil, harvest. Okay, it totally, totally was kind of a, just an everyday situation in their society. So it's everyday kind of, um, it's kind of routine every day, but they're stories with a meaning. And in that time, Middle Eastern teachers would often talk by parables. It wasn't only a thing that Jesus did. And they're a bit like the riddles of their day. It's important to understand this, that, that actually it was like a, a truth that was surrounded by a story that had a sense of riddle. In other words, it made you think. Now, the problem with us reading the parables is we know the punchline. You know, it's like when you've heard a joke, okay? And when you hear a joke for the first time, you, take, you get taken on a story, and you hear the punchline, and you think, ah, oh, that's funny. <laughs> okay? Or not, as the case may be. But once you've heard the punchline, you kind of, it, it takes a bit of the impact out of the bit before. And of course, we know the punchline of the parables. But to these first hearers, they didn't. They kind of think, so, see, what, what? They provoke you to think out of the box. They provoke you to think differently. Very important. They're not just illustrations. And also the parables which we get introduced to here are very much about the kingdom of God. They make, they're going to reveal something that is kind of secret, but now can be known. And it's made known to those who are close to Jesus. Okay. So I'm just going to hit some headings and, uh, and just try to get under the skin of this parable a bit. First of all, just the priority. And it's very clear, and I guess it's the title for this, is listen. Okay? It's where Jesus starts. He says, listen. In verse 3, listen. And he tells a parable, and then at the end of the parable, he kind of he, he sandwiches it again by saying, look, for those who've got ears to hear, you know, not just ears, but ears to hear. In other words, listen, listen. It's fascinating, just in the worship, there are kind of prophetic things stirring us. Listen. So the priority is that we've got to listen to this. It's one of the, the, the things that Jesus wants to get into his disciples. There's a very powerful scripture in Isaiah 50, which prophetically speaks of Jesus. And it says this, that daily... He wakens me morning by morning. He wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. And that is true of Jesus. And it's been true of us that one of our prime, one of our priorities that God calls us to is this. Listen. Listen. And that's why this parable is key to all the other parables. It's like a master key that opens up all the other ones. Because if we don't listen, we miss the point of all the other parables. Listen, priority. And then we've got, what's the revelation? Well, there's something that's not immediately obvious, but actually needs to be very obvious, that actually... It says that the seed is the word of God. That's the message about the kingdom of God, the change that Jesus can make in people's lives. And if you pray that prayer this morning, the kingdom of God has come to you. It's the beginning of a whole new adventure of knowing the kingdom of God. But the kingdom of God, the message, isn't just out there. It's found in a person. And that person is Jesus. Actually, he is the seed that was prophesied throughout all the Old Testament writings. He is that seed. And this story that we read about in Mark of Jesus, we'll, we'll get, you know, literally on a journey going through these towns, villages, eventually end up in Jerusalem, that we read that actually 
He himself is that seed. And some people reject him. Some people like him for the moment. But when it gets tough, they don't. Some people kind of think, oh, yes, yes, yes. They kind of receive it, but it's like their lives get cluttered with other things. But actually, there's some good soil that this seed of Jesus, as it were, this message of Jesus lands in, and their lives get totally transformed. And again, we've read about, oh, we've heard about it the last couple of weeks. You can go on. We, we, give, we read about this d- guy who's demonized. He has the, the power of evil. It's so, so wrecked his life. And yet, it's good soil. Jesus transforms him. There's a harvest, hundredfold. So this parable, first of all, points us to Jesus because the kingdom of God is found in Christ the King. Okay? Go and see that revelation. Otherwise, we can just read this parable as tips on listening to a sermon. Okay? Do you get the difference? And it's ever so important. We can sort of think, oh, this is a guide to how to listen to sermons. No, it's not. We can get some hints from it, but no, it's not. It's, uh, it's, it's to re- reveal Christ, who is the fruit-producing seed of God. God has a farming program. And his farming program is a seed, this world, with a message of the kingdom of God found in Jesus. That's what it's about. That's what we can know. And, that's, and we're part of that. And it was Christ. So we looked at the priority, just looked at the revelation. It's Jesus. It's about Jesus. But then we look at the challenge, and there is a, there's kind of a dual aspect to this parable. There's the revelation of Christ, and then there is actually some teaching on discipleship. How do we respond to Jesus? And that's where we get into this bit about the soils. And basically, you've got these four different sorts of soil. You've got the path, the hardness of heart of the path. You've got rocky heart. You've got cluttered heart. And you've got good heart, good soil. Or to kind of land that in our context, okay, you've got sowing the seed on the 595, right? You've got sowing the seed on the summit of Skidder. Or you've got sowing the seed in an overgrown vegetable plot. Or you've got sowing the seed in George and Pauline's vegetable garden. Thank you, garden, garden. I'll just put in here. They were earlier. I was, I was going to praise them for their vegetable garden, but I missed them. Anyway, next time you see George and Pauline, can you tell them they've got a great vegetable garden? Okay. But anyway, the thing is, it's, it's, it, you've got to understand these different images. And they express something about our hearts. And these heart conditions, they really haven't changed through the ages. First one, the, the, the hard heart the resistant heart, it, we have an enemy, and Jesus says, Satan, Satan snatches it away. Do you know, it's an amazing thing, whenever God is at work and speaking, there's some, even before the words are out, that have been snatched away. Even before, even before the words are uttered, they've gone. What? What was that? So important we understand this. It's about us, our hearts. So instructive. If we don't get this one, we won't get the rest. That's what Jesus is saying about the parable. Hardness of heart. If you were to turn to Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, and no need to do it now, but if you were to turn there, you find the writer has much to say about hardness of heart. There's a real appeal there of today, do not harden your heart. It's almost like a daily thing. 
You know, we can, you know, it, it, it's, it's like there's a challenge each day. Am I going to hold my heart or not? And he goes on and say, don't be like the people of Israel who in, in that time of the wilderness, they harden their hearts through sin and unbelief. Very important. So how does our heart get hardened? It's by sin. You see, if we, now, you know, we all slip out. We all say, I sin. But if we live with unconfessed sin and don't deal with it, a crust forms on our heart. And it goes deeper. It goes deeper and it becomes hard. And we become unbelieving. So we can hear these words that God's saying, but they don't penetrate because they bounce off unbelief. They bounce off unbelief. One of our particular ways of unbelief in this nation is cynicism. We can be so cynical, and it's, it's, a, it's a hardness of heart. We need to kind of think, okay, God... Give us a soft heart. This is my prayer. Please hear this. No, I'm preaching to myself. We need to see God's heart softening treatment program. Okay? We have lots of programs these days. We have great spa programs, don't you? To make you look 10 years younger. How do we, how do we, how do we soften the heart program? Well, we need to be honest before God. When we do sin... When we have sinned, we confess it. We're honest about it. We confess it. We do that with humility. We don't make excuses, oh, I couldn't help it, or it's his fault, her fault, their fault. No, we do it with humility. We confess it. We believe, and I thought it's so good what Chris prayed about those receiving Jesus this morning. He said, and now God forgives you. You're forgiven. What, as easy as that? Are you sure, Chris? Yeah, sorry, that was a rhetorical question, but you can answer it. Yes, he is sure. Why? Because when we confess our sins, Jesus has already, he, he forgives us. We've, we've, we're set free. It's as easy as that. Because he paid the price. Keep our hearts soft. Us be filled with the Holy Spirit. What is God speaking to you about today? How we respond to that can keep our hearts soft, or if we don't, it hardens something. It's very challenging. Oh, rocky heart, okay? If the hard heart was the resistant heart, the rocky heart is the superficial heart. We receive it with joy. It's like, woohoo! You know, there's a sense sometimes, and it, I can know this in my own heart sometimes, you can hear saying, yeah, yeah! And then you hear a hard time. And the hard time wins the day. <laughs> We've got a number of folks in the church here who are going through some very, very tough times. And over these last few weeks, or after a few months, been you know, me alongside other people, spent time with those folks and you, you get involved with them. And I, I know my aim when I go to visit someone like that is I want to be encouraged and say, Lord, let me be an encouragement. Please, please, please. That's my prayer as I'm driving there, okay? Lord, let me be an encouragement. When I'm driving back, I think, I've been encouraged, I've been encouraged, I've been encouraged. The encouragement I get is always bigger than the encouragement I give. And why is that? Because these people walking through tough times are finding that actually they're putting roots into God. There will be tough times. And tough times will take many shapes and sizes. And those are the, but those are the very time when roots can grow. We don't have to be rocky heart. 
We don't have to. God has a, a program of taking that which we receive with joy and make it deep into our lives. And it's a very precious fruit when you see that in people's lives. It's very precious. Apart from rocky heart, okay, you've got this thorny heart, which is the distracted heart. How current is this? Worries of this life, deceitfulness of wealth, and desire for other things. You could not imagine it to be more 21st century. You know? What is rampant in our days that we live in is anxiety. The worries of this life. If it was true then, how much more today? Yeah, I actually wrote these notes a few weeks ago, and I've got anxiety is triggered by big global issues. And the first thing I put down was terrorism. Just thinking of past events, not knowing that between writing these notes and actually speaking them, you know, we'd be living with the fresh news of something that's hit our nation. Politics, economic outlets, there's so many big things out there that feed a deep anxiety. Young people are struggling with an anxiety that is very real these days. Older folks, that's us, that's me, by the way. We, the, the temptations to be full of anxiety are just manifold. And then, so you've got the big issues, and then you get to the real personal issues, so even things like social media. And you just hear so many tragic stories these days. I remember reading one in the paper a few weeks back, a few months back, about the, you know, some dear young people that were addicted to the selfie. Addicted to the selfie. Like addiction, like that cosmetic surgery, taking thousands of pictures of themselves daily. And their life was being wrecked by it. Anxiety is rife. And then deceitfulness of wealth. Well, you know, kind of just, just going to state the basics on that. Money, wealth isn't bad. Money is essentially good. It's the place it has in our hearts. When it has the wrong place in our hearts, that's when it becomes deceitful because we then put our security, our trust, our future, our hope, our, co our contentment, everything into money. We say money is the answer. If only I had more then my life would be so much happier. That's the deceitfulness. It's not money in itself. Jesus is so spelling it out simply for us and helpfully. And then a desire for other things. Do you know, we are beings with desire. Human beings have desires. Okay? Okay. Yeah, I think it's one of the things that makes us different from animals. Animals have appetites. We have a dog, as you've already gathered, you know. Thank God for dogs, okay? We've got a dog. Our dog has an appetite, okay? But there's something different about a desire to an appetite. There's something very human about a desire. It actually reflects something or the very image of God. God has desires. We have desires, Okay? It, we're, we're, we're actually defined, a quote I've got here, which says, you, you're not defined, we're not defined by what we know, but what we desire. What are we desiring? Other things? We can sell it easily, can't there? So many things. And it's so subtle, isn't it? I had this great trip with some of the guys. R Ricardo organised a trip to a Scottish bothy um, a couple of weeks ago. It's a great time there. Uh, but I was the guy with the least kit. Okay, I was the I was the bothy newbie. Okay, so I was the newbie to bothies. I kind of had boots and waterproof, but not much else kit. And and, and so Ricardo actually did a fantastic job. He kind of lent kit, whatever. And I thought, there's some kit I need to buy. 
And I thought, now, I want to be careful on this, so I kind of set myself some targets of what I buy and what I borrow. And then I'm opening up Trail Magazine, I'm going in shops, whatever, and I think this, that, and that. I could, and suddenly my desire for kit was awakened. <laughs> it was like this great big kind of, kind of desire for kits. And it was like, oh, yes, 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 and there's this and there's that, and that's going to make me walk better, and that's going to make me look better, and that's going to impress others on the mountain. And suddenly, that desire for other things. You know, I run a bit. You know, you sometimes get a running magnet. I think, crumbs, if I buy those shoes, they will really make me go faster. <laughs> okay? Some of you, you know, it, it can be a hundred, it could be cars. It could be cars. It could be, you name any subject under the, under the sun. Gardens. You know? You know, you think, oh, yes, I've just have that plant. Now, it's not these things are wrong. But when desire for other things rule our hearts, do you know what it does? It chokes a passion for Jesus. We're no longer desiring him first. That's what Jesus calls us to. It's to love him, to know Christ. This is, we've got to read these scriptures. I love this story because did you get the whole kind of out the outplaying of the story. Jesus teaches the crowd. And then he's alone with his disciples. And that's where the explanation comes. And he's basically saying, guard your hearts. Because we can have good hearts, the receptive hearts. It means knowing Jesus. It means putting him first. It means actually the whole point of the parable. Listen! Listen, listen, we can actually, even out of today, we can, we, you know, we, we, we can leave, you know, we can be rocky, we can be, we, we can be hard, we can, we can be distracted, we can be, or we can say, God, would you so speak into our hearts? If you're not a Christian this morning, it might be you've prayed that, prayed that prayer. That's receiving, that's being good heart. Good soil. But if you haven't, don't worry. You can still be good soil. We can do a weeding thing in our heart so that we receive his word. The receptive heart is the, is the heart that accepts his word. And somehow we cultivate. You see, discipleship is not what we can make of ourselves but it's allowing the sower and the seed to produce a harvest of which we are incapable. <coughs> just to quickly finish with just two other things, then we're going to pray. There is a provocation in this parable, and it's so easy. I, I, kinda, I could finish now, okay? I really could finish, but it'd be almost wrong not to, because there's a provocation. Jesus draws a line. It's, it's there in the middle. It's the, bit, the, the uncomfortable bit to read out loud in verse 12. Okay? And he kind of is all drawing a line in, this, in the Gospel of Mark between the insider and the outsider. It kind of starts uh, at the end of chapter 3. Those inside the house listening to him and those outside who are complaining, critical, or against him, like rocky soil. And there's an inside and an outside theme. And it can be uncomfortable to read. But we've got to let the challenge of it hit home. Jesus is drawing a line. Now, the truth is this. He wants outsiders to become insiders. But there is a line. And the line is this. It's following Jesus. That's why that lovely little verse where he says, when he was alone, 
the 12 and the others around him. You see, what defines us as inside or outside is this, is relationship with Jesus. And this provokes us. It says, am I in or am I out? Most of us prefer the fence in the middle. Are we in or are we out? Well, we can be in the process of moving out towards in. There's a provocation. And then just after this parable, interestingly, you've got, you've got a couple of other parables, and they're both the seeds. One says, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day, whether he sleeps or get up. The seed sprouts, grows, though he doesn't know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel. And then a bit later in the other parable, what, what should we say the kingdom of God is like? What parable should we use to describe it? It's like a mustard seed. Smallest of all seeds on earth, yet when it's planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants. Such big branches that birds can perch in its shade. Fascinating, Jesus goes on to tell two other seed, seed parables. And both of those seed parables speak about the sovereignty of God, what God alone can do. He alone brings the growth. He alone does it. Those parables just say it's all about God's growth. And yet this first parable, it says, but listen, take heed how you listen. I'm going to pray. And I just sense, perhaps the band, could you just come, come up, Chris? Okay. We're going to have a, a, just a song of response. We were going to break bread this morning, but we won't now. We're going to do that next week. Okay, we're going to next week. We're kind of a little bit flexible about it this morning. Uh, but I think there's just a, a song of response. And, yeah. and as we do so, I just feel God wants to... There is a response of heart. Some of you are battling with real anxiety. It might be anxiety about family, finance, work, relationships, health, the list goes on. Others of you, I just, you kind of know if you were to do a heart, a stock take of the heart, you know you've got distracted. You know your heart's got cluttered. And I believe there's almost like some weeding of the heart to be done that we can just do. Okay, and it's between you and God. You know, so last week we, we had a great time praying for people for healing and we were praying for one another. I just sensed to this morning it's between you and God. You and God. It might be you just feel, do you know what? My heart has got crusty. Then God can break that up wonderfully. There's a soft heart. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. I've known crustiness. I've been a I've been right old crusty heart at times. I think God just softens it. It might be you feel I'm still an outsider, that I'm yet to make that step across that line. It's your opportunity. There's a number of things to respond to there. Okay? I'm just going to let the band just lead us ju just in a song. Then, 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 then I think we'll, we'll just pray and uh, ask for a real response. Okay?